So could you please introduce yourself and what company you're with? Okay, um, my name's Scott Harbour. I am a uh, senior technical artist at Criterion Games. Okay, so when did you first realize you were morphing into a technical artist from your original role and what was your original role? Um, originally I was uh, an artist working on um, on the uh, well, on the game environments. Um, we were called the track team back then. And um, I realized I was turning into a technical artist around the year 2005 um, during a project called uh, Burnout Revenge. And um, when we first started it, we just finished Burnout 3 and the artists were doing training to bring everyone up to speed and help new hires get in. And at the time we were doing our training just in our modeling packages because we couldn't get the engine to work and we didn't have the art support to get our stuff into the pipeline. And just for fun, in my spare time, I um, managed to work out how to get things in. Total hack process, nothing we could ship with, but at the same time, it was enough to get artists up and running. And in one of the reviews, one of the art leads caught wind of it that I'd managed to do this. And it became pretty obvious where I was heading and pretty much by the end of the project I was a TA in all but name and then got made up to one the project after. Oh, fantastic. So that was a great example of, of you know, what required your skills. Do you want to give another example that required like specific TA skills to solve? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so on our last game, um, we sort of changed up the way we made worlds. Um, got into open worlds, but at the same time it was um, basically like we'd stuck a load of tracks together and we were trying to sort of emulate every car commercial you've ever seen where you're the car driving on the windy road and you can see gorgeous landscapes that just go on forever and look amazing wherever you look at them. And we'd never done anything like that before. So there was basically this big, this big scary task that can just be summed up as how do we do terrain? in our budget, in this open world, and make it look good. And, yeah, I mean, you know, I wasn't doing it alone. We had really talented graphics programmers and really talented artists as well, but, you know, there was that level of ownership at a tech art level. Um, here's the problem, here's a set of ingredients on how to solve it, figure it out. And that is very much the sort of general sort of challenges that TAs face. Oh, man. So you came from the, uh, the art side. Um, how much self-directed learning was required to become a, an effective TA? Um, pretty much all of it, to be honest. I mean, the role of being a TA is like a, a never-ending learning process. Um, the role didn't even exist five years ago, and many of the things I do are based on principles that didn't exist like three or four years ago. So. Basically, you just got to stay ahead. <laughs> Basically, you just got to stay ahead of everything. Um, know what you're going to need, and if you think there's something that might help, you know, spend some time looking into it. You know, do a bit of R and D on the side if you have to, and just figure out what you need to know, and just effectively give yourself just enough education to get the job done. Uh, so, what kinds of math do you find yourself using, kind of on a day-to-day -day basis? I find myself using a lot of vector math these days because um, I got into shaders in a big way in the last three years or so. And while I'm nowhere near good enough to do some of the crazy hardcore maths that some programmers can do, I can do a lot of the basic stuff. Um, so yeah, things like dot products and cross products and all that stuff. So it just makes, makes me all warm inside. <laughs> uh, any like really crazy levels of math that you've had to go into for? You know, maybe a specific shader or something? Or? Well, this, this is part of the beauty of being a TA, because a lot of the time you do stuff like shaders and that to prove that things are possible, or to potentially optimize things afterwards, but you don't replace a code team. So if you want to show that something's going to work, or even just prototype a way of doing something, nine times out of ten you can go on a SIGGRAPH or a GDC course notes and you know, find someone's code fragment where they've actually got it working, and then it's less about writing crazy math yourself, but just copy-pasting their crazy math in, getting it in engine. Mm, that looks nice. Can we afford it? And <laughs> you, you, you have that advantage. Oh, that's fantastic. So, like, 
in your in your career, what sort of low level technical concepts did you really have to you know come to grok to be able to to be really effective, like maybe with a terrain system or or something else? Um, well, a lot a lot of the uh, well, like you say, a lot of the high level aspects of it, things you learn on the job, you know, like what what's an exporter, how the builds work, that kind of thing. I mean, low level, I was quite fortunate with my university course in the they taught us everything. You know, I had, you know, we were doing trigonometry in the first year. We had computer programming. In my first term, they taught us how to basically make a CPU from scratch at logic gate level. Didn't really see the point of it at the time, but actually having a strong fundamental background in, like, the very low-level things does, does help out because it just helps you understand the issues pretty much before they arise. You know, you know, you pretty much know what's going to be expensive when you put it in your engine, and you know things that are or are not going to work because you've got a vague idea of the architectures that you're dealing with. Okay, where'd you go to school? I'm, I'm curious about who had that kind of program. Um, do you know the uh, NCCA s school at um, Bournemouth University? I am not familiar with it, but I'm going to have to look into yeah, it. Yeah, they're, they're good. Okay. Um, now, you came from the art side. Um, were there any additional artistic principles that have uh, emerged, or uh, is there... <laughs> that have emerged since I went TA? Or? Yeah, or, or, I mean, are there things that you miss about art being a TA, or is this just kind of like, <laughs> you know, being pure, like pure art, if there is such a thing? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 there is still such a thing as pure art. Um, I wouldn't say I miss it, because um, be, being a TA, you know, it's the same level of creativity and the same level of challenge that you'd expect from being an artist. It's just a different kind. You're, you're yeah. still making awesome visuals, but you're doing it with a slightly different tool set than an artist may have. And being a TA, you tend to work pretty much shoulder to shoulder with your art team all the time anyway, so I don't know if this is the right way to word it, but it's almost as if you're doing the art vicariously through them because, you know, you're they're influencing it. you, you're influencing them. Yeah. It's, yeah. Okay, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah collaboration, I, it just, I love that feedback loop. So need it for... And, and, it's yeah, definitely. Well, and we need it in education, so this is where, where the question is, if there's one thing you could tell educators about, like, if they're interested in starting up a TA program, or what, what do we need to know about TAs? I don't know, I mean, think about the TA program. I can imagine it being very difficult to do, because right now all of our senior people in, in our industry regarding technical art, they start as, uh, they either start as artists or programmers and eventually evolve into that role. Part of the reason they're so good is because, you know, they've done their time and earned their stripes and they know the trials that an artist goes through and can, you know, almost preempt things. Whereas if you're doing it at school, you come in on year one, I'm going to be a TA. Unless you have, like, that core art component in there at the beginning, they've got almost no grounding to base what they're learning on. And similarly, you need that you need that balance even at that level where you have you have your um, TA students doing the art but also having some exposure to the code side of it as well and then see how they pick up from there I guess hmm. so maybe we just need to have art you know, our art track be a little more technical but still be artists possibly it exactly. sounds like it worked really well for you exactly yeah. Yeah. is there anything else you want to say I mean this has been a great conversation but thank you um, <laughs> Well, I suppose, I suppose I could just summarise you know, what, okay. what being a TA is basically like, because, I'm, I'm, again, I'm probably wording this wrong, but it's like, being a technical artist, you're always at a disadvantage in a studio environment, because you're the worst of both worlds. The coders are smarter than you, the artists are more creative and talented than you are. But the thing that makes you valuable to both of them, the thing that makes you almost indispensable, is that you can learn things fast. You can pick things up quicker than they can. You're, you're resourceful and you have a clear sense of uh, ownership of the tasks you have and you're easily adaptable and I don't know if they're things you can teach but the best TAs tend to have it and that's the sort of thing you want to encourage and look for when educators are setting, setting them up. Fantastic way to wrap up. Thank you very Thank you. much.